Okay, so last time we started to discuss the idea of the ray tracing, uh, which is one of the basic idea in terms of like doing some rendering in the graphics pipeline, uh, and which is basically radically uh, different uh, the approach with the res validation. So in the compact graphics deployment, we can consider two uh, very fundamental ways that we can basically render some 3D things into the 2D uh, image. Uh, like one is the res validation, and the other thing is the uh, ray tracing. So what we uh, mostly just focus on in the introduction of the course was about the restoration, basically projecting all the 3D polygons in the 2D plane and also doing some kind of the processing in the image space, image plane. While the uh, the difference with the ray tracing is that in the ray tracing, we are not basically projecting things in the 2D, but actually it's the opposite, the other way around. Uh, we are shooting the rays uh, from the camera center uh, into the 3D space through the image plane in terms of that we are now fetching some of the uh, some color, many other the information from these 3D objects from the point where we are seeing some kind of the intersection between the ray and the, all these 3D objects. So in the algorithm-wise, uh, what we could see as a kind of a difference is that in the restoration, uh, we you know, for all the triangles that we are having in the, the mesh, we are projecting them into the 2D plane, and then we start to you know, care about some of the pixels that are included uh, in the, each of the triangle, and then basically interpolating all the color detection information, and then basically updating the final images uh, when the depth that we are calculating is basically you know, uh, shorter than the depth that we are having in the, uh, the depth buffer. So this was the, basically the high level of the algorithm of the restoration, uh, while the ray casting is kind of the opposite. So now for each of the pixels on the screen, that we are shooting the ray uh, into this 3D space and checking the intersection point uh, with the 3D objects and basically fetching all this information from the uh, 3D scene. And ray, trace, ray casting was the case that we only care about the uh, intersection, the first uh, the hit point, the intersection point with the 3D space, uh, while the ray tracing uh, is kind of the more complicated uh, the framework uh, that is not just like you know, checking the intersection with the ray and the objects, but actually kind of like back tracing all the paths of the objects uh, by basically following all the second the secondary the ray. Uh, so for each of the uh, intersection the point, now we also basically see uh, where the ray actually came from. So you see what we can see here is that uh, it's more about some sort of the uh, reverse engineering. So if we actually wanted to do some kind of the more like physically correct some kind of simulation uh, for the some the light traversal, then we could actually start uh, this kind of the, some you know, tracing of the rays from the light source. Uh, but then the problem might be is that uh, there might be tons of the rays that are not arriving into the image plane. So the computation will be very inefficient. So actually that's the kind of the reason that we are doing some kind of the back tracing. So we are not starting from the light source, uh, but actually we are starting from the camera point. And then we are doing some kind of the you know, back tracing of the all the trajectory of the lights in terms of that. Uh, and also for each of the intersection the points, we are seeing you know, where the ray came from, uh, from the which the kind of the uh, from the each intersection, uh, the you know, the heating with the objects. And then we are shooting the all the secondary rays uh, until we see that whether the ray uh, arrives at the, the light source where the, the kind of the uh, iteration, the recursion basically reaches to some kind of the maximum the number. Uh, so this is the basic idea for the ray tracing. And once you basically back trace all these kind of the paths of the rays uh, for every single day intersection the point, we also shoot the ray into the light source in terms of the, uh, you know, to calculate basically the color information uh, for each of the, the uh, intersection the point. So actually, you know, as you can see, uh, there are two main things. So when you see some kind of the intersection between the ray and these three objects, uh, we should be able to basically compute uh, the secondary ray, basically where the ray came from, uh, from the intersection. Uh, so basically uh, calculating this kind of reflection at the point is one of the things that we are going to uh, discuss uh, in this course. And also for each of the intersection the point, we also should be able to uh, calculate the color information by just like also fetching the information from the lights first. So based on the material the property uh, for each of the objects and also based on the light information, uh, we should be able to basically somehow determine the color information for each of the point. Uh, so that's also about basically some natural properties of the 3D uh, the objects. And these are also things that we are going to discuss uh, in the rest of this course. Uh, so we also discussed many of the ideas in terms of like how we can really calculate this kind of the ray and the object at uh, the intersection. Uh, so we also with some kind of some calculation, with some kind of the plane and the triangle and sphere, and also with the implicit representation, uh, we also discussed basically how we can uh, calculate this kind of the intersection point.
So those are basically very uh, basic things that you that these are also the things that you will need to uh, implement in the program media assignment. And then basically the question is that, so then the problem is that this is the case that we need to calculate the intersection between all the rays, basically for all the, the pixels in the image and also for the, all these 3D objects in that we have in the 3D space, uh, we should be able to basically calculate all this kind of the intersection, uh, which will take tons of time, especially if we have like lots of the triangles uh, in the 3D space. So here the kind of the, some technical the idea uh, was that how we could have basically accelerate uh, this kind of the uh, computation of the intersection. So one of the kind of simple idea is basically making some kind of the bounding volumes uh, for some kind of the subset of the 3D objects, some triangles, uh, in a way that we can basically you know, facilitate uh, this kind of the intersection the computation with some kind of the simple geometry. So especially if we consider some kind of the axis aligned uh, the bounding the, the boxes, uh, those will be the cases that we are having the uh, three pairs of the slab uh, for each of the axis. Then we can see that the, the computation of the intersection becomes like much easier uh, for those kind of the axis aligned the bounding boxes. Then the question is that how should we also define this kind of the bounding boxes? So we also discussed the two extreme the cases. Like if we make like one giant the bounding box for the entire scene, uh, the problem is that if the ray hits that bounding box, then there's no difference. Basically, we need to also consider all the objects in the scene uh, to check the intersection with the objects uh, with the ray. Uh, so that's also not that efficient way. And if you also consider like having the bounding box for every single day primitives, so that also does not make any kind of difference in terms of that. Still, we have the n number of the kind of the bounding boxes. So, so here the question is that how we can make some kind of the, uh, some hierarchical structure of the bounding boxes or some kind of the, some bounding primitives uh, in a way that we can do some kind of the more efficient uh, the computation. So basically what we are going to do is that we are sort of like extending the idea of the binary the search tree uh, in the one the search. So if we have some, this kind of the a sequence of the integer number and if we want to let's say query, uh, if, when you have some kind of query number and uh, finding some kind of the closest uh, the integer in this the, the sequence, then how we are going to uh, do this kind of the search uh, in a more efficient way. So one of the ideas that we learned uh, in the algorithm course might be using like having this kind of the binary search. So every time, like given the sequence uh, of the integer, the number, we are taking the median number and making this kind of the two subsets. And for each of the subset, we also pick the median number and making the two subsets again. So in this way, you know, we can make some this kind of the tree structure and, this, and then this, this kind of tree structure makes the, uh, the, the complexity of the computation to be low grand scale, right? So here, basically the idea is that how we are going to do the same thing. Uh, not only in the 1D space, uh, but also in the 3D space. Uh, so for that, basically, we discussed the idea of the bounding volume the hierarchy. Uh, so this was basically the case that like you know, we are uh, splitting the one basically big, you know, uh, the bounding box uh, into the two, basically these two the sets. So this is the case that we are having the uh, this big bounding box. And we want to basically split this into the two distributed sets of the, the primitives. So here, basically, one thing is that we are basically finding these these two uh, the sets of the primitives. Uh, but for those kind of the cases, the bounded boxes of those sets uh, can still overlap in the three D space. So we are basically repeating this kind of like making some sort of the sub bounded boxes in a way that we can build some kind of the some binary tree uh, in the three D space. So for that, I mean, there can be some multiple ways to basically construct uh, this kind of the tree structure. Uh, and what we can do basically is that. Uh, for each of the step, uh, we have first determine the axis that we are going to uh, do some kind of the split. So we can basically choose this kind of the axis that's going to be uh, one of the x, y, z axis. And then we can also start to make some kind of the some candidates of the split, the planes uh, in the space. So this is kind of the 2D example that we are having some multiple kind of the object in the, in the, the space. And for this given the axis, uh, in, for this axis, we are making some kind of the uh, candidate the planes. So there can be also many kind of the heuristics in terms of like how we're going to make this kind of the uh, split planes. So this is the example that we are having this some uh, uniform the integral of the all these split the planes. Uh, but we can also basically determine this kind of the candidates based on the uh, the shape of the geometry. We can first, for example, like make the all these split uh, the planes at the corner, like at the end of each of the, the primitives or based on the centroid or many other things. So there can be some kind of multiple ways that we can uh, propose some kind of the candidate the planes. Then here the question is that uh, we are choosing one of the best plane uh, 
uh, that will basically uh, you know, somehow make some more efficient the search. So here the question is that uh, how can you determine that you know, which plane is which split uh, is kind of the best split? So that was kind of the question. So what we discussed last time is that so we discussed uh, this specific example. So when you have this kind of the objects in the two D space, and if we are finding some kind of the uh, some best the split planes in terms of making the two bounding boxes, how are we gonna uh, make this kind of split? So if we just like follow the idea of the binary the search tree, that what we are going to do is that we might basically sort uh, those things. So based on the order, we can see like this like one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight. So we are having the eight the primitives here. Uh, then the, if we just follow the binary the search, then we might want to basically split those kind of things uh, by just having the uh, one bounding box, uh, which are basically having the half of the primitives, and the another the bounding box, which are basically having the another the half of the, the primitives. Uh, so this will be the example that you can see uh, here. Having these kind of two bounding boxes, those are the cases that we are having the same number uh, of the primitives for each of the cases. And that's actually what we have done uh, in the binary search tree, right? So if we just follow that, then we're gonna have this. And as you can see, the problem is that now we are having like two big bounding box. So as we basically have the bigger the bounding box, there is a, like more chances that the race would basically hit uh, this kind of the bounding box, which means that we start to also uh, investigate like all the kind of the primitives that are included uh, in this bounding box. So for basically making some more efficient uh, the search, uh, kind of the important thing is that it's better to have some kind of the tighter uh, the bounding box like this, right? So as we basically have some kind of the smaller the, the bounding boxes, uh, there will be basically less chances that the rates basically hit each of the bounding boxes, then we can easily ignore some kind of the, uh, all the primitives that are included in each of the bounding box. Uh, it is clear. So here, basically, the idea is that how we are going to make some kind of split of the bounding boxes uh, in a way that we can basically make some more kind of efficient search uh, while having some this kind of the tighter the bounding boxes. So there can be lots of the heuristics for that. Uh, one of the heuristics that we can choose might be is that so we can somehow define this kind of the travels of the cost. So here, basically, the uh, the travels of the cost uh, means that. Uh, we are having some kind of the cost of like visiting each of the interior the, the node. Uh, so basically we can do some kind of the bounding box the test. And then now we care about like these two things. For each of the two subtrees, so we are going to have the two subtrees, uh, we can calculate how likely a ray will basically hit uh, each of the, the bounding box of the, the subtree. And also what's the kind of the cost of like basically traversing all the things uh, inside each of the subtree. So these are basically uh, two quantities that we can define, right? Uh, does it make sense? For basically, we are having some kind of the constant uh, the cost or like visiting each of the, the bounded box. And for each of the candidate display plane, we will be able to define the uh, left subtree and the right subtree. And for each of the subtree, we are going to somehow measure like how likely a kind of the random ray will hit uh, the bounded box of the old the, the subtree, and also what will be the cost of like visiting uh, each of the, the, the subtree. So somehow we are going to uh, uh, somehow approximate these kind of quantities in a way that uh, we can define some kind of the variables of the cost. Then what we can do is that given the set of the, the candidates of these split the planes, uh, we can basically calculate uh, this kind of the variables of the cost uh, for each of the plane, and then we can basically choose the one that is giving the minimum the cost, right? Uh, it is clear. Any question on this? Any questions? So yeah, I mean, this is kind of like one model in terms of like how we are going to measure uh, the efficiency uh, for each of the split the planes. Uh, and we can basically uh, model this kind of the cost of the travels in this way. And here the question is that how we are going to also the model this probability and also the, this cost uh, for the subtree. Uh, there can be many other ways uh, we can do this. Uh, very simple, the idea that people typically use uh, to construct the the bounding volume the hierarchy is that we simply uh, we can approximate the cost of like visiting each of the subtree as the number of the primitives. 
So that will be the case that we want to basically, uh, not basically having this kind of like too many primitives for each of the debugging boxes, right? So uh, we once the very simplest, uh, the way would be is that you know, we are approximating this course of like visiting each of the subtree as the number of the primitives that will be included uh, each of the, the subtree. And here the more, more important part might be is that uh, how we are also going to uh, the measure of the probability that a random ray uh, will hit the bounded box of each of these subtree. And for that, you know, what people typically do is that uh, people may basically care about the uh, the ratio uh, of the the surface of the the, count, the bounded boxes. So, for example, like when we have, uh, let me go back to the previous one. Yeah. So when we have this kind of the the cases, uh, we're gonna have this kind of the uh, sort of the parent node, the bounded box of the parent node, and we're gonna also have the bounded box of the subtrees, right? And for each of the bounding the primitives, here the bounding primitives at the boxes, right? Uh, we can basically measure the surface uh, of the, these, uh, the bounded boxes. So when, when the SN is the surface of the bounded boxes of the, uh, the parent node, and the SA is basically the surface of the bounded boxes of the one of the, the subtree, the A subtree. Uh, we are basically using this as kind of the, the ratio of like how likely the ray basically will hit uh, the, this bounded box when the ray basically comes into this kind of the bigger the bounded box. So using this kind of the ratio of the surface of the, the bounding primitives, uh, it's kind of the one very simple heuristic that we can use. And this kind of the idea is called the um, surface area heuristic, uh, which is also assuming that uh, the arrays are basically randomly distributed and also there's no closure in the space. So when you have this kind of the, the assumption that we can simplify uh, the kind of the approximation of the probability, how likely the array we will hit uh, each of the subtree uh, based on the kind of the, uh, the ratio of the surface area of the bounded boxes. And that can be kind of the one simplest kind of way uh, that we can somehow measure the travels of the coast. So it turns out that this kind of the travels of the coast uh, becomes like this formulation. So we are having some kind of the constant coast and for each of the uh, ratio of the surface, we check how many kind of the, um, you know, the primitives are basically included uh, for each of the debounded box. Uh, so that means that you know, we can, given a candidate, set of the candidates of the split planes, uh, we can calculate this kind of the travels of the cost uh, for each of the plane, and then we can choose one that is giving the, the minimum the cost. Uh, so that's kind of the very uh, typical the heuristic the idea uh, in terms of like building the bounding volume of the hierarchy. Any question on this? So I, I know that in our the programming of the assignment, there is no such part or like making some sort of the data structure that can make the uh, the rendering process to be more efficient, basically reducing the computation of the intersection. Uh, but if you are interested in, and I also recommend you to try to implement the bounding volume the hierarchy in terms of that you can also uh, render very large scenes uh, with the lots of kind of the objects in the scene, uh, basically accelerating this kind of computation with this kind of structure. Any questions? Clear? Yeah, so this was kind of the one example where we are making some kind of the hierarchical structures uh, by basically splitting the primitives in the space, basically making some kind of the two sub kind of the sets of the, uh, the primitives in the space. But actually the other way around, uh, making some kind of the, some specialty data structure is actually not dividing the given set of the primitives, but actually dividing the region in this region space. So the left is kind of the example that we are having the bounding volume the hierarchy. Uh, this is the case that we are having the disjoint sets of the primitives. So as you can see, uh, you know, uh, we are having this kind of the uh, the blue set and the yellow set, and blue are basically the uh, sets that are including this kind of the left side the primitives, and we are having another the set. Uh, but this is the case that the bounding volume of each of the, the subsets uh, can overlap in the space. So this is basically the one example. And the other way around is basically partitioning the space. So now we are having the uh, these join the sets of the regions. So we split uh, the space into using this kind of plane uh, in terms of like making these two other uh, you know uh, disjoint the bounded box in the space. 
Uh, but then this uh, the problem is that here uh, the one primitive can be can belong to the you know, multiple uh, uh, the sets. So this is not the case that we are basically the partitioning the sets of the primitives, but partitioning the space. So one of the famous example for this might be the KD tree or the oak tree, many other things, right? And in terms of like utilizing these kind of structures in the ray tracing the framework, uh, what would be kind of the pros and the cons? Uh, can you guess? The first question, uh, when you use these different structures of the some hierarchical uh, the data structure, what would be kind of the pros and the cons? And also the question was that cost of the ray primitive intersection is also calculated by, by the bounding box test. Uh, yeah, so it also depends on how we define all the things, but uh, at the end of the all the things, like at the leaf node, if we have like bounding box for like one single primitive, uh, then that can be also the things. And also at the end, we will need to basically have the, uh, some computation of like checking the intersection with the ray and the primitives in the, the leaf node. So that should be included in the leaf node. So let's think about some scenarios where like one of those kind of structures can have some more of the advantages over the other one. Yeah, so actually my question is that uh, in which case like one can be better than the other? Uh, let's think about some cases. Any ideas? Yeah, so there might be many specialty cases that you know, one can be better than the other. For example, like as someone also mentioned in the this this lab, like we we have some like really uh two very disjoint set of the primitives. Like we, we are having like one set here, like having some like some one set of the primitives on the left hand side, and also the other set of the primitives on the right hand side. And it can be more efficient that we are having these kind of the two bounding boxes, uh, instead of like partitioning the space, right? So this can be a better way that we are really making some kind of the, uh, the tight deep bounding boxes. So depending on the arrangement of the objects, actually one can be better than the other, right? But also one of the some specialty cases is that actually the one question is that uh, for each of the cases, let's say we are making some kind of the binary tree, which means that each of the intermediate uh, the node uh, will basically have some kind of the two children, right? Two children node. But here the question is that let's say we check that the ray is hitting uh, the one of the the children node, then can he just ignore the other the the other the uh, the child node? For example, in this case, uh, let me try to shoot a ray, for example, like this. 
Yeah, I don't know if you can see. So yeah, as you can see, like this is kind of the ray which is coming here from the outside of the box and just hitting the yellow the triangle. And what we can see is that like you know, let's say like we first check the intersection with the ray and the this uh wrapped the bounded box. And we're gonna basically see some kind of this uh, intersection uh, with this ray and this bounded box. But as you can see, actually. Uh, you know, at the end, like what you can see is that uh, the object, the primitive that should have the first intersection, the point with the ray, uh, should be this yellow triangle, not any of the blue triangle, right? But still, we are seeing some kind of the intersection with this kind of the left bounded box, uh, because we are also uh, not partitioning the space uh, with the bounded boxes. Uh, so which basically means that there are lots of the cases like when you shoot the ray and when, when you find some kind of the intersection with the, one of the uh, the children node uh, in the bounding volume of the hierarchy, uh, actually there is a chance that actually the ray uh, will have some kind of the intersection with the, with the primitives that are not included uh, in the left set, but actually in the right set. Which means that since the bounded boxes are not basically partitioning this piece, uh, we should not just ignore the other the, the bounded boxes in the, the same level. That we need to do this kind of the uh, intersection the checks uh, with the, all the uh, the bound boxes in the same level. Uh, while this is not true for the special the space partition in the case, uh, since we are partitioning the space, uh, if we find some kind of intersection with the uh, one set of the, the the children the one of the basically the children the node, then we can immediately basically ignore the other the, the child node. Uh, so that's basically kind of the difference between these two. Uh, so which means that for most of the cases, uh, except for some kind of the extreme D cases, uh, uh, except for some of the extreme D cases that we are really having some kind of the, some kind of very sparse, uh, some kind of the, some groups of some kind of the primitives, uh, for many of the D cases, it is known that uh, the space partitioning can be more efficient uh, in terms of that we can terminate the search after we see some kind of the first hit uh, of the debound boxes. Uh, but the problem is that uh, when you start to have some kind of the some dynamic scenes, uh, so for some of the cases, when you have some kind of the animation and all the primitive is basically be moving in the space, then the problem is that uh, we will need to basically reconstruct uh, all this kind of the bounding about the uh, the hierarchical structure uh, for the space partition in the case. While in the case that we are having the primitive partitioning, uh, when you still have some kind of some dynamic the movement of the, with all the primitives, uh, we can just keep the same the the hierarchical structure. So that can be kind of the good uh, in terms of that we can when when you have some kind of the dynamic the scenes, uh, the bounding volume the hierarchy can be more efficient in terms of that we don't need to reconstruct uh, everything. So those are kind of the, some pros and cons, and there are many kind of the other the pros and cons. Uh, so we can also uh, discuss those things later. Any questions on this? Is this clear? No question. Okay, so if there is no question, let's move on to the main topic that we will need to discuss for today. Uh, Okay, uh, can everyone see my slide? Yeah, so yeah, so let's discuss uh, the main topic for today, which is the uh, radiometry and the photometry. So those are also the things that we briefly also discussed in the intro introduction of the course, uh, but these are basically very basic the terminology that we will keep utilizing for all the discussions in the rest of the course. So you will need to get familiar with all the terms that we are discussing for today. So as I also mentioned at the very beginning, basically we are discussing this you know, ray tracing the system. And here the key thing is that basically how we somehow model this kind of the reflection of the rays. So how are we gonna determine the direction of the secondary rays and also how are we gonna determine this kind of the color and all the information uh, from the combination of the material information and also the light source information. So those are basically the main things. And for that, like what we are going to do is that uh, we are doing some kind of the optics simulation. 
uh, as much as possible. Obviously, the, the simulation that we are doing may not be that you know, very physically correct, uh, some kind of the approximation, but it's still it's kind of like approximation. So we are going to basically discuss some of the terms that are used uh, in the optics and see how these terms will be basically calculated uh, in some kind of the, our the simulation the setup. So that's, those are basically many things. Uh, so as kind of the first step to basically model all these kind of like reflection of the things, basically modeling this kind of illumination, uh, we are going to discuss some terms uh, that are basically typically used uh, to basically measure uh, some of this kind of illumination and the lighting. And basically we're also going to discuss some of the, uh, some of the units uh, to measure those things. Uh, so there are basically four main quantities. And as you can see, these names are basically quite confusing, uh, very similar, uh, but you, you need to get used to uh, the difference of like those kind of the terms. So we are first going to discuss the radiant flux, uh, which is basically about the power, and the radiant intensity uh, is basically about the power per, per power you know, per unit the solid angle. So we're gonna see what's the meaning of the solid angle, but it's more basically more about the, some kind of direction uh, of the light. And irradiance uh, is not uh, the power per the solid angle or the direction, but it's more about the power per the unit area. Uh, so this is another term. And also the radiance is basically the power, the flux per unit area and also per unit solid angle. So those are basically the four main terms that we are going to discuss for today. So keep this in mind. Uh, so what's the kind of goal of the like having these the four terms? Uh, so all the kind of things about the radiometry uh, is to do some kind of the calculation of the lighting uh, in a physically correct manner. Why we are having some kind of the uh, some of the assumptions here, and uh, obviously we are assuming that lights are basically traveling in the straight lines. So basically this is assuming that uh, lights are basically traveling in the empty space, and there is no influenced by some kind of the gravity and all the things. So basically all the lights basically travel in these straight lines. And obviously we also assume that all of the objects have the size which is like much larger than the wavelengths. So if you have like very tiny small the, the objects, then all the assumptions that we are having here might be just broken. So we are also basically assuming that uh, the objects are like big enough uh, compared to the wavelengths, uh, which is like very tiny kind of things. And we don't model any kind of the deflection or the interference. Uh, we only care about some kind of reflection, the model that you can uh, typically see. So those are the assumptions for the radiometry. And let's also briefly see how the light basically works. I mean, those are some kind of the basic things might be in the, the physics, uh, but this is not the basic course. So we are not gonna get into the very much details for all the things. But very highly, there's some kind of the assumption here uh, is that basically all the lights are basically generated uh, by basically consuming some energy. So what we are going to see is that basically lighting is kind of the process that we are consuming the energy uh, in terms of that some of the energy is turned into the heat and some of the other part of the portion of the energy is basically turned into the photons, uh, which are basically delivering some kind of the amount of the energy uh, through the light. Uh, so this is the basic assumption. And what we typically do in the computer graphics is that uh, we just assume that the ratio of these two uh, basically turning the energy into the heat and also the turning the energy into the photons uh, is basically a uh, constant for each of the light source. Uh, so we don't care about like how this kind of ratio is, is basically uh, changing over time, but for each of the light source, we are having the same the ratio of like these two, uh, turning into the heat and also turning into the photons, uh, which means that uh, the power which is delivered uh, by the photons uh, will be basically uh, proportional to the kind of the energy that we are consuming. Uh, to generate the, the lights. So in for this region, uh, we are going to uh, use two terms, power and the energy, uh, as kind of interchangeably because these are basically some kind of the uh, proportional the quantity uh, in the the lighting. Oh, you are still seeing some old slides. So you are not seeing this slide for the lighting. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me stop sharing and just reshare. Why this is okay.
Can you see this slide now? Is this different slide with what you have seen before? Oh. Let's see. Oh, yeah, thank you for letting me know. Uh, I think it's okay. So yeah, so let me then briefly uh, go back to the previous slide. So yeah. So yeah, so I was basically saying that these are basically the four the terms that we are going to discuss. Uh, yeah. By the way, like you can also find these slides in the link that I also posted on the Slack. So you can also check out uh, those slides as well. So those are the four terms that we are going to discuss. And then, yeah, so we are having this kind of assumption, like the light surface traveling is straight lines. And obviously, the object has the bigger size than the wavelengths and no modeling for the deflection and the interference. And yeah, so those are things. Basically, we are going to assume that like when we basically uh the the kind of the light source, like the light bulb, is consuming the energy, uh, we are having the uh constant ratio of the photons that are also basically uh you know, you know delivering this kind of some portion of the energy into the, the light. So in this reason, I mean in terms of that you know, we are having the constant ratio that we are turning the energy into the heat and also turning the energy into the photons, uh, we are going to uh basically interchangeably use the, the, these two terms power and the energy. So power is basically the, the energy, which is basically delivered by the uh, the light. And here the energy basically means that the amount of the energy that we are consuming uh, to generate uh, this kind of the light. So this is basically the basic the assumption. And also uh, the other thing is that uh, we are also going to discuss uh, some different terms like also interchangeably in terms of that. Uh, so what we are going to mainly discuss is some terms uh, that are defined in the radiometry. So radiometry is all about basically the power of the light or some kind of the quantities uh, that are basically defined based on the power of the light. So those are kind of the quantities defined in the radiometry. And the photometry is kind of uh, different in terms of that these are some quantities that are defined based on the brightness uh, that is really you know uh, recognized by the, the human eyes. So those are like all about the brightness, uh, the photometry, and the radiometry is, is all about the power, uh, which is delivered delivers by the light. Uh, but also the thing is that for all the quantities that are defined in the radiometry, we're gonna see that there are some kind of the counterparts uh, that are defined in the photometry. So you can see this kind of the different names uh, that are kind of like indicating similar thing. So those are kind of the basic things. So the things that we are going to discuss from now might be a little bit boring in terms of that I just keep saying some kind of the new terms. Uh, so let, but yeah, you will need to get used to those kind of the terms to uh, discuss the rest of kind of things. So I also recommend you to check out these kind of the definitions uh, after the lecture and see and you know what's kind of the, the differences. Okay, uh, so let's first get into the radiant energy. Energy is basically just nothing, basically the energy, uh, which is really delivered by the light. Uh, and also the energy has the, the unit of the joules. Uh, this is basically the things that we are also seeing in the physics. Um, and when you also talk about the radiant the flux, uh, which is about the power, uh, which is basically the energy, which is either emitted or reflected or transmitted or received, received per unit time. So this is basically uh, some energy over the time. So this is the flux. Uh, so basically for the, the power or the flux, we are having the uh, unit of the watt, right? So this is basically the unit that we are typically uh, using the radiometry and the, uh, the counterpart of the unit in the photometry is the lumen. So those are basically two different kinds of the things. So when you talk about the radiant the flux, uh, the same kind of the quantity, some corresponding the quantity in the photometry is called the uh, luminous flux. And for that, you know, we are having the uh, some quantity, the unit of the quantity, which is the lumen. And here the question is that then are these two the same? So if we have some kind of the uh, 10 watt sort of the, the light bulb, then is it the case that we're having the 10 lumen? Uh, obviously no, as I said, like the watt is basically the unit for the, the energy, uh, basically for the power, and the, the lumen is the basically the uh, unit for the brightness. But we are basically assuming that uh, kind of the ratio of like these two uh, will be the same uh, for each of the light source. 
that also means that if we have like different light source, if, so depending on when you have the LED bulbs or some kind of fluorescent LED tubes, uh, there can be some more efficient uh, the light source, uh, which is making uh, brighter lights with the while consuming the same amount of the energy, right? Uh, so that might be the case that we are uh, using the smaller the amount of the the power basically while making some kind of the brighter the light, or there can be some kind of like less efficient kind of the light source which is basically uh, making the same the brightness of the light uh, while consuming the more energy, right? So depending the light source that we are having, there can be some kind of the ratio between these kind of the two units, right? So if you actually you know, buy a some kind of the light bulb, then you can check out the how much of the white the, the watt is consumed uh, while making how much of the lumen of the brightness the, the light bulb is basically generating. So those are basically two things. And based on these two quantities, you can check out the kind of the efficiency uh, of the light bulb. Does it make sense? So this is the basic thing, uh, the radiant flux, uh, which is about the power of the light. Uh, and then we are going to discuss some kind of the different things uh, in terms of like the intensity, which is about the uh, power per each of the direction. It's basically about like the per direction, where the per solid angle. And also we can think about the light, which is like falling on some kind of a specific the point over the surface. So it's about the like, per uh, the surface, per kind of the, the area. And also we can think about some basically the light the ray which is traveling in the space, uh, which is the radiance, which is the per solid angle and per the area. So we're gonna get into those things. So the next thing is about the radiant the intensity. Uh, so basically intensity is now the power over the solid angle. And the solid angle is basically about the kind of the direction. And so uh, and also we're gonna see this solid angle has the uh, the unit of this tor radian. Radian. Yeah, we're gonna see like what this basically means. And uh, it will basically divide the lumen by the, the store radian. Uh, then we get the another kind of new unit uh, for the uh, photometric, which is about the candela, uh, which is about the intensity. Uh, so here the question is that what's the solid angle, right? So we know the angle. Uh, so we are going to extend the, the concept of the angle into the solid angle. So when you basically talk about the angle, uh, which is basically the ratio uh, between the uh, the length of the arc, which is basically subtended by the uh, angle here, uh, with the, ra the the radius of the circle. So let's think about like this uh, the circle here, right? Then if we define any kind of the angle like this, then we're gonna see some kind of the the arc the curve here, uh, which is basically subtended uh, by the given the angle, right? Which means that for each of the angle, we're gonna have some kind of the corresponding the length of the arc curve, uh, which is defined by the, the you know, uh, subtending this kind of the given the angle, right? The EP basically measure the ratio of this, like the length of the arc curve uh, with the radius of the circle, then they, this becomes the, our, the, some kind of the unit of the angle, right? So this is the quantity uh, which is defined as the radian, right? Uh, it is two. So basically a circle has the two pi uh, radians. And you know, for any kind of the angle, we can basically uh, have the radian as kind of the unit uh, for the angle, which is basically calculated at the length, uh, the ratio of the length of the arc curves and also the radius. So middle school kind of things. <laughs> so what we are going to do is that we are going to extend this thing in, into the some uh, for the three D sphere. So this was the case for the two D circle. Uh, so if we extend the same thing for the three D sphere, now we can also think about like having a some sort of the angle, um, which is actually the solid angle, uh, uh, which also will basically um, uh, you know be extended uh, into some kind of the not a kind of the region here. But into the volume, right? So we can think about a kind of the cone, uh, which is defined with the some solid angle, right? That will be projected uh, over the three D sphere. Then we can also define the region uh, over the sphere, uh, which is uh, defined as kind of the you know 
which is basically subtended uh, from the given the some sort of the solid angle here, right? Then as we have done for the angle case, now we can also define the unit of the solid angle as kind of the ratio like of this area, which is subtended from the given the solid angle over the, not the radius, but the, uh, the squared radius. So now this becomes some kind of the unit of the solid angle. So you can see that solid angle is kind of the angle for some kind of the point uh, in the 3D space. And now we can have some kind of the unit of this solid angle uh, by calculating this ratio, like A is the area which is subtended by the given the solid angle uh, over the basically squared the radius of this sphere. So that becomes the definition of the solid angle. And what we can see is that uh, since the surface uh, of this sphere is four times five times R squared, then which means that uh, the the solid angle uh, of the, the sphere will be four pi, right? So we're gonna divide this by R squared, then we're gonna have the four pi, uh, the, the star radian, uh, which is the name of the unit, the solid angle. Uh, it is clear. Any question on this? Yeah, so what we can see is that, uh, let me give you some kind of example. So we are on the speed, the earth, there is a moon and the sun, right? Uh, I don't know, it's, it's way far from the moon, right? And actually we can also see some kind of the, define some kind of the cone like this, uh, making the each of the moon and the sun as kind of the, some kind of the objects that is defined as kind of some sort of the, sort of the section of the, the cone here, right? So actually, let me uh, give you some better figure than this. So like even this kind of the uh, the earth here and the moon and the sun, uh, we can also define some kind of the solid angle, uh, which is defining some kind of the projection uh, of, of the, each of the moon and the sun, many other things uh, over the, the earth. And this kind of projection actually can be defined with the solid angle. So the also interesting thing is that if we really calculate uh, the you know, solid angle, which is like subtended by the sun and the moon, uh, we can actually see that the solid angle of these two are almost the same as the 60 uh, micro distorations. And where can you see this kind of the evidence that these two uh, solid angles are almost the same? We, we, we know those kind of things, right? Uh, when can you see this kind of the evidence that these two actually, the solid angles of the sun and the moon are almost the same? No idea. Have you seen the yeah solar ellipse, the total ellipse? When we see some kind of the cases of the, the total the ellipse, you can see that actually the sun is totally occluded by moon while making some kind of the very thin ring, right? Uh, which means that uh, sun and the moon are basically having almost the same the uh, the you know the solid angles basically making the almost same the projection the area over the earth, uh, which is very interesting kind of some natural kind of the phenomenon the fact. Yeah, so that's kind of thing. Uh, so that's kind of thing. So, so we are basically having almost the same the solid angle for the sun and the moon. So which means that uh, if we know the surface area of the, the earth, then we can also calculate the region, uh, the area of the region of the, the projection from the, the sun and the moon, which will be almost the same. So can we quickly calculate those things? What would be kind of the, uh, the area of the projected the region of the sun and the moon?
yeah, maybe I can go a bit quickly because we have many things to discuss shortly. Uh, so like this will be the case that like four pi is story again, we will have the 510 uh, million squared kilometer, which will be should be the same with the 60 micro like store radian with some kind of the area, right? So if we basically calculate these things, then what we're gonna get is that uh sorry, yeah, this kind of the amount of the uh the size of the region, uh which is like four times bigger than Seoul or desert. So quite a big region, right? So we can basically do this kind of a calculation. So based on the all these solid angles, actually we're gonna do many kind of the calculations. And so one of the calculations that we're gonna do is basically having some kind of the differential the solid angles. So when you have some kind of like utilize uh, the speaker the coordinates uh, for the surface uh, over the sphere, uh, we can define the differential the area like this, right? So if we utilize the uh, speaker the coordinates. Yeah, the differential the area over this the sphere uh, can be calculated in this way by just like multiplying r times d theta here and the r sine theta d pi, uh, which is by defined here. Basically, this length, the yeah, this length and this length uh, can be multiplied to define the differential the area, uh, which is defined like this. And based on that, you know, we can also define the differential of the solid angle, which should be uh, differential area divided by the square, uh, the, the square the radius. Then we're gonna see that actually uh, differential of the solid angle can be calculated as this form by multiplying these two angles and design the, the setup, right? Uh, and also for the rest of the kind of the, the part of the, the slice, we're gonna basically use this kind of omega as kind of the some uh some mathematical denotations to um uh, denote some kind of directional architecture. Um so actually also what we can see here is that uh if we have some kind of the light source uh which is like emitting all the lights with the uniform the intensity uh into the only the direction, then what we can see is that and also when we see that this is the amount of the flux uh which is emitted uh by the uh, the, the light source. So let's think about that we are having some light source, which is having this uh, pi amount of the flux and also emitting the light into the, some uni uniform the intensity uh, into the old direction. Then we can calculate this uniform intensity as kind of the pi over the four, um, this, yeah, pi over the, uh, the four pi, right? So this will be, uh, it can be computed uh, based on the, our the definitions of the solid angles. Right? Great. Uh, some questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, and from, so we can really do some kind of some very you know, practical calculation. So when you see some kind of the light bulbs, which is saying that that has the uh, 815 D lumens, then you know how can you calculate some kind of the intensity for that, the candela? Uh, so the way that we can calculate the candela is that if we assume that the light bulb is basically emitting all the lights into the with uniform the intensity that we can simply divide uh, this amount of the uh, the flux by the uh, store again uh, that we can calculate the, the intensity like this. Here, like one quick question is that then let's think about some special case where the light bulb is not emitting the light into the uniform intensity into the all the directions, but somehow if the light is basically making some kind of a cone like shape. Uh, which is like concentrating all the emission of the light into the uh, some cone uh, with the diameter the of the 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 angle is kind of 20. So let's say we're having the light bulb here. Uh, somehow this light bulb is basically like emitting the light into uh, only into the this kind of the cone. Then how can you compute uh, the intensity in this case? So this is the question. And Actually, you will realize that this computation is not very simple because the quantity of the store radian uh, is defined based on the area over the surface, right? So which means that uh, when you also define some kind of cone uh, with the angle the theta here, uh, we should be able to uh, compute the area of the uh, you know this region. 
uh, which is like making some kind of the defined based on the intersection of the cone and the sphere, right? So this kind of a region, uh, which is defined based on the angle here, and the, also the radius here, uh, is called the sphere curve cap. Uh, so if I give you some kind of the hint uh, in terms of how we can calculate all the things, uh, this area of this speaker cap can be actually just simply calculated as kind of the 2 pi r h. Here the r h is this length. And uh, since we are having the, the angle theta here, the diameter, of like the, actually the radius of the radius angle of the cone, uh, actually you can see that the h is the same as the r1 minus cosine theta. Uh, then we can see that actually the speaker, the area of the speaker cap uh, becomes this. Right? So from this, actually, we can calculate uh, the uh, intensity uh, for the cases that when the light is basically concentrated into the uh, some, some the cone with the 20 degree. So, yeah, uh, of the cone, right? Then based on this fact, uh, can you calculate this? So let me give you the hint. So if we know this fact, the speaker the cap has this area, then based on this, can you calculate the intensity here? Yeah, I mean, maybe you can really just calculate the, the final number and see what you get. Yeah, obviously that would be basically 815 over like 2 pi, like, you know, 1 minus cosine 10 degree, right? Uh, so if you calculate this, then what you get is that actually I just calculate this using the chat GPT and it was giving me like uh, this, right? Which is basically, sorry, yeah, way higher uh, than the intensity that we can see uh, when the light is basically emitted with the same intensity, right? So yeah, we can do all this kind of the calculation uh, with the stuff, I mean, the solid angle and many other things. Any questions on this? So we discussed the flux and also the intensity, uh, which is like flux by the solid angle. So those are basically two quantities. And we're gonna also see the definition of the E irradiance. Uh, irradiance is not the power per the solid angle, but actually the power per the unit area, uh, which is like coming into the over the surface. So we're gonna basically compute this term uh, in terms of basically calculating the amount of the light, uh, which is basically uh, arriving at the same point uh, over some kind of three really space from the all the directions. Basically, the light comes can come from the all the other directions, from the all different distortions, or even from the uh, reflections from the many other the objects. So this is basically the quantity uh, that we are basically defining kind of the, the power per the unit area. And now we are also having some kind of the new the unit for this, uh, lumen over the square diameter, which is now defined as the lux here. And also you can see some kind of the typical number of the lux for the many kind of things. Uh, so the sunlight has to like more than 100,000 lux, and some kind of this in the sunrise, it is decreasing until like 40, so very you know, uh, small. Right? And also the moonlight even has to be like even smaller than the one lux. That's very, uh, so you can see that the sunlight is like way much more brighter than the moonlight. So we can have this kind of the quantities for the radiance. And also when you talk about like radiance, uh, all those kind of things, like one kind of the important thing is basically the Rambert's the cosine law. So what we can also see is that no, let's think about that we are having the same kind of the light source, uh, which is kind of the making the flux uh, with some kind of the, the beam of the light. Uh, so let's think about that we are having this kind of sort, sort of the some area light, uh, which is in the having uh, the same area of basically emitting the light. 
Uh, so making some kind of the cylinder like the beam in this space, uh, we are receiving uh, this kind of light in over the plane like this, right? So then what we can see is that you no, know, when we basically have this kind of the direction of the light, which is basically perpendicular uh, to the, the plane, then the amount of the radiance that we're gonna get would be basically when this you know, pi is kind of flux and A is the area, then the radiance will be the pi over the area. So this will be the radiance that we're gonna get. So this is basically the power per the you know unit the area over the surface, right? But what you can see is that if we basically have some kind of the slanted angle uh, of the light is emitting to the, the surface, uh, while this direction is not the same uh, with the normal direction of the plane, but having some kind of the uh, some slanted angle, then we can see is that uh, for the same this kind of light source with the same the area of the light, actually this light will basically cover the bigger region, right? As we basically have some kind of the some tilted uh, the, the direction of the, the light. Uh, this kind of light source will basically start to basically cover some kind of bigger region, uh, which means that when he measures the radiance, uh, which is the flux per the area, per unit area over this, this pier, uh, over the surface, uh, as we basically the light is basically covering the larger region, uh, which becomes like larger as kind of the A over the cosine this setup, uh, basically the radiance uh, for each of the region will be decreased. Uh, so that's basically what we typically see. Does it make sense? So as you basically you know, somehow change the direction of the light in terms of that the light is basically not seeing the uh, the plane in the kind of the perpendicular direction, but with some kind of some slanted angle, the seeing the area light will basically start to basically write the bigger region, which means that uh, for each of the some kind of the unit area, the amount of the light the surface is basically receiving uh, will be decreased. Uh, and the amount of the decreasing can be calculated as kind of the one of the, uh, the basically as kind of the cosine the setup, right? As some kind of the projected, uh, the surface here will be increased as kind of the A over the cosine setup, right? So which means that as we basically have some kind of the, some slanted the angles of the light source uh, coming from the kind of space uh, into the, some bigger the, the surface, uh, we're gonna see that the radiance is basically being decreased with the amount of the cosine the setup. Uh, so this is the kind of the law, which is called the Lambert's the cosine law. And this is actually one of the reasons, I mean, actually the main reasons that why we are having the seasons now. So we are in the spring season and we also see the, have the winter season. Uh, so when you have the, the spring season, then we can see that actually the, the direction of this kind of the surface over here and the direction of the light coming from the sun, basically this, this angle is basically kind of small, uh, which means that we are more like directly getting all the kind of the, the energy of the light. So which means that uh, we are getting some kind of the more kind of the power of the light. Uh, but when you basically have this kind of the uh, winter season where basically the angle between the surface number and the light direction becomes larger, uh, then the radiance uh, for each of the region will be decreased. So we are basically getting some kind of the less amount of the energy for each of the region. Then we are basically having the winter. So this is kind of the reason that why we are having the season. So, Also the four off, uh, you know, as we basically, so let's think about that we are having the light, which is light source emitting the lights. Uh, so when you receive the, the light with some kind of a smaller the radius like this, or when you receive the same light with the bigger the radius like this, obviously as we get farther and farther from the light source, uh, the, the energy of the light that we are receiving for each of the, some, uh, the region over the sphere uh, will be decreased. So which means that uh, the irradiance will be decreased as we basically get water uh, from the given the light source. Any question on this? So we discussed uh, flux, which is about the power and the intensity, uh, which is like flux over the solid angle. And this is the irradiance which is like blocks over the each of the area. And the last term that we are going to discuss is the uh, radiance. So radiance is basically the power emitted, reflected, transmitted, received uh, by a surface per unit solid angle and also the per area. So, and also this basically has the unit of that, which is dividing the, uh, the lumen by the store radian and also the square meter, uh, which becomes the heat. 
So this is basically another the kind of the unit uh, for the in the photometry. But here also the key thing is that we are not basically just like having this kind of quantity for just the per area, but actually we are having this quantity per the projected area. So that's basically why we are also having the, the cosine theta here. Yeah, so we are not just having this like dA here, but dA, the cosine zeta. Uh, this is basically based on the same reason of the, uh, the Lambert the cosine law. So here, this is not the case that we are basically for the having the same radians, um, same same the, the flux. Uh, this is not the case that we are basically changing the region uh, to be covered by the same the light. Uh, but while this is actually the case that you know, while we are having the same dA, how much is this kind of the the solid angle of the of the light from the different directions will be changed. So while actually we are having the uh, so kind of the different way to interpret this. Actually, in my understanding, is that you no know, in having this project area is basically the same that we are having the same dA, uh, same kind of differential dA area while basically adjusting, uh, you know, the solid angle uh, for each of the direction. So what we can see here is that you no, know, if we basically have some kind of this slanted angle here while we are fixing the differential dA area here, then what we're gonna get is that actually this will be the case that uh, we are having this projected the area, uh, which is perpendicular to the light direction. And this uh, perpendicular, uh, the, the projected area will be d a the cosine d theta, uh, which means that if we fix the differential area to be d a, this will be the case that we are decreasing uh, the solid angle to be, you know, d omega to the cosine d theta, right? So based, based on the angle that we are seeing the same region, uh, we are also adjusting. So this can be uh, interpreted that we are basically defining the, uh, either define the radius t based on the project area, or we are having the same the differential area uh, while adjusting uh, the, you know, the solid angle as the, you know, by multiplying the cosine theta. So that's basically the definitions of the, uh, so, yeah, the radius. So keep this in mind that we are basically having this quantity as kind of the per uh, unit solid angle and also the per unit the projected area. So that's why we are having the cosine set here. Yeah, basically the idea came from the uh, Lambert's the cosine rule. So yeah, these are also some kind of the common the, the quantities, uh, the numbers of this quantity. Uh, from the sun, we are having the like, what's that? Billion or two billions of units, while we are also having some very uh, small kind of units from the moon. And also, we can think about like two types of the radiance. Like one is kind of the like incoming instant radiance. So uh, for each of the region, uh, we can basically think about basically having some kind of the incident the light from many different directions. Uh, that will basically be uh, contributing uh, to calculate the radius at one point, right? So for each of the point, we're gonna have this kind of like incoming the radius, uh, which will be basically uh, you know uh, cut used to calculate the radius at each of the point. And after the reflection, uh, we're gonna we will be also able to define the exiting radius, uh, which is now amount of the the light. Uh, which is basically also leaving this the surface into the certain into the some specific direction. So basically, we are having the two types of the radiance, which is like one is about like incoming the radiance, and the other is about like the exiting the radiance. Uh, so the reason that we are basically uh, talking about those kind of things is that uh, we really need to differentiate like these two. So when you basically have this kind of like incident the radiance for some specific direction. It obviously does not mean that we are also basically emitting the same amount of light uh, into the, some specific uh, into the same directions. So what we actually we are going to do for the all the rendering the process is that we are going to accumulate all these kind of the incoming the radians from the all the different the, the directions and based on our some kind of the refraction the model we're going to also calculate uh, this point of the outgoing the radians uh, as kind of some uh, with some kind of calculation. So basically, we're gonna distinguish uh, the incoming, the instant radiance, and also the exit radiance uh, based on the already the formulations. Any questions on this?
So yeah, radiance is kind of the main thing. It's the fundamental the quantity uh, that basically characterizes like all the distribution of the light. And also we are obviously assuming that the radiance is basically uh, you know invariant along the ray. And all the rays are basically moving you know, like straight like in a straight line and basically delivering the same amount of the radiance over the space uh, without basically assuming that any kind of the occlusion in the space. And what we are going to do with the so-called the rendering equation uh, is basically all about basically calculating this kind of the radiance or the irradiance uh, over the space uh, that can be basically change basically with some kind of the reflection uh, with the ray and the, the objects. And then by uh, accumulating all these kind of the, some changes of the radiance, uh, we're going to basically get a uh, final the rendered image. And these are the quantities that we discussed. So well, given the energy, we also define the power, which is the energy over the time. Intensity is the power over the solid angle. And relativity is basically power over the some the um, the unit the area. And also the radius was the, basically the power over the project area and also the solid angle. And for those kind of cases, uh, we also have some kind of the counterparts uh, in the photometry uh, the field, um, and also there are some kind of the units that are defined based on the uh, brightness. Any questions on this? Yeah, so before we end the two days the lecture, let's just briefly see one more thing. So let's see some kind of a simple example, like how we're gonna uh, determine the irradiance based on the information of the incoming irradiance, right? So what we can see is that basically we can determine, calculate uh, the irradiance uh, from the given the information of like the uh, radiance over the, the, the all the directions, right? So when you think about like one single point over the sphere, and when you basically define, assume some kind of a flat plane, so that you know, we can consider only the hemisphere uh, for the all the directions. So over the all the directions, like defined with this kind of point over the hemisphere, uh, if we can have some kind of information about the incoming the radius, then we can basically calculate the irradiance as kind of the integral of like this form, right? So we have the cosine theta here uh, because of the definitions of the uh, the radius, right? So we're gonna also call like this kind of the term. Uh, the, the amount of the uh, the the radiance times the cosine theta and the solid angle. This is kind of the differential the irradiance, uh, you know, which can be uh, used uh, to calculate the final the irradiance, right? So what we need to do is that uh, we are taking the integral of the differential the irradiance over the hemisphere, and this differential the irradiance is now defined as kind of the multiplication of the irradiance and the cosine theta and the the, uh, the solid angle, right? So this means that uh, if we assume some kind of the constant, uh, the uh, the incoming the radiance uh, over the all the directions. So let's say L is basically the constant, uh, the incoming the radiance from the all the directions. Then we can actually just calculate that. So end of like all the this kind of calculation, we can see that uh, then the irradiance, uh, you know, by accumulating all the things, uh, can be now calculated as kind of the L times pi. So these are some types of the calculation that we are going to do uh, in the rest of the course. Any question on this? Please? Yeah, so we discussed some kind of the multiple the terms uh, in the terminology of the radiometry which might be quite confusing, like these very similar names, like radiant flux, intensity, radiance, and the radiance, those are like all very similar the names with some kind of the difference, some kind of units for each of them. Uh, but it's also uh, important to see that, you know, we are basically, why we are having this like the cosine theta term, uh, which is coming from the Lambert cosine rule, and how we also define the solid angle, right? These are also kind of the basic kind of the things in terms of like defining those things. So what we are going to do is that 
uh, given some kind of the sum information, as you can see here, given the information of the incoming the radius, we're going to compute the radius. And based on that, we're going to also calculate like outgoing the, you know, you know, the, the radius uh, based on some kind of the natural properties. So what we are going to do for the rest of the, uh, the, the course, uh, we will be like doing all this kind of the calculation uh, based on those quantities and how we're going to also kind of like uh, make it efficient uh, to calculate all those kind of things uh, in some kind of the discrete manners. So that's kind of the basic ideas. So I strongly recommend you to get used to basically all these kind of the names and the concepts of those quantities so that we can discuss more about the random equation in the next time. Any questions? Clear? So yeah, if you have more questions, please feel free to ask the questions on this slide. And uh, from the next week, uh, we are going to start to discuss some metal properties and also the rendering equations. So how exactly you're going to calculate all these kind of quantities uh, in the ray tracing system. So I'll see you next Monday. Thank you. Bye.